we are starting again. Hope you had coffee and walk a little bit. So let's start. Please take your seats so we can start. Okay. Uh, so after our introductory session, we are now going to have our senior lecture for today. Uh, I am very proud to introduce you Professor Eric Lasso from Princeton University, the famous Princeton University. We are very glad that he was able to come here and to share with us all his experience uh, with this area of energy, specifically bioenergy. Okay. Professor Lasso, you have the floor. Thank you, Suani. Thank you, uh, Jose, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I thought I should give a little bit of an introduction to myself uh, to set the context for what I'm going to talk about. I'm with the uh, Energy Systems Analysis Group within the, it's called the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University. And you'll notice it's, it's the Energy Systems Analysis Group, not the bioenergy systems analysis group and that means that we work on lots of different energy issues so over the course of now I've been with this group for almost 35 years and we've worked on bioenergy but we've worked on wind energy we've worked on hydrogen we've worked on energy efficiency we've worked on nuclear energy fossil energy so we were interested in solving energy related environmental problems and whatever wherever that takes us and it happened to take me to Brazil for the first time in 1984 when I was starting to study the energy use in the sugarcane industry. And uh, I've had the opportunity to, to visit many countries where sugarcane is, is produced and uh, sugar and ethanol are produced. And so I've had a chance to see how things work around the world. And, and I have to say that Brazil is always the, the uh, the highlight of, the, of, that, of that sugar uh, processing world. Um, and most of what I know about sugarcane, I've learned from people like Suwani and, and others here in, in Brazil. Um, so my approach, uh, so what we do in my group is, is to think about technologies that generally haven't been used in, in particular applications and then think about how they might be repurposed for uh, solving an energy problem. So for example, in the sugarcane industry, we did a lot of analysis around gasification of the gas uh, with uh, use in a uh, syngas in a gas turbine for power generation. And this, this idea has been mentioned uh, previously here this, it, at the workshop. Um, it's still a technology under development, but it, it looked quite interesting when we were examining it. I've also done some work in the pulp and paper industry, which is another uh, bioenergy, uh, an important bioenergy producer, both in Brazil and also in the United States. So let me, let me ask, um, how many of you here are studying bioenergy specifically at your universities? Okay, so a few of you, all right. Um, and, and how many of you are uh, chemical engineers? Mechanical engineers? Not engineers. Okay, all right. So that gives me a little starting point. Um, okay, so I'm gonna speak, uh, and a lot of the issues that I'm gonna touch on you have already been touched on, um, but biomass is an interesting uh, and complicated energy resource, and uh, I think uh, I'll have a different perspective, which I hope will uh, help, uh, help your understanding of, the, of some of these complicated issues. And uh, I'm going to start by talking about what I think is the distinguishing characteristics of biomass uh, compared to other renewables. So it's 
biomass is the only carbon carrying renewable energy source, right? Um, photosynthesis converts CO2 from the atmosphere into stored carbonaceous energy. And then when we use that energy, uh, the CO2 goes back to the atmosphere. So in principle, it's a, it's a, uh, a closed um, sustainable system. And that's, that's that fact that biomass carries carbon is very important when we're talking about particularly things like biofuels where you want high energy density in a fuel. The other, the other important thing, and I'll talk more about this uh, at my second lecture today, is the idea that you can get negative emissions with bioenergy. So if you store the carbon from the atmosphere in the biomass, use that, some of that energy in the biomass uh, for, for energy, for fuel or electricity, but you can also capture some of the byproduct CO2 and store that underground, you now have a negative emissions energy source. Um, and that may be important in the longer term uh, in stabilizing our, our climate. Um, and that technology, pe pe people, ref whoops, people refer to it as uh, BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And the last uh, distinguishing value of biomass is that it's probably the most contentious renewable energy source because of all the complications that come with, with it and the fact that it's so closely tied to land use. So it, 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 uh, there's a lot to, be, lot to think about and a lot to be uh, uh, attentive to as you're doing, trying to develop bioenergy projects. So here's, uh, here's an outline, a quick outline of what I want to talk about. And please um, raise your hand and ask questions along the way, especially if something I've said is not clear. Um, I think there'll be plenty of time for discussion. So um, and I'd rather have you ask the question when it when it occurs to you. Um, so I call, uh, how many, how many, uh, how many know this book, A Tale of Two Cities? Okay, who wrote that? Charles Dickens? Yeah. So A Tale of Two Cities is a famous novel that begins, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Um, that's the first line of the book, and I think bioenergy is in some sense that, and I'll, I'll tell you why I, why I uh, think that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about photosynthesis and, what, and its limitations. Uh, Charlie Kinoshita talked about this a bit in, yesterday. Um, and I'll talk about what I think are the sort of the sustainable biomass resources. There are some that are unsustainable. Um, and then go into the sustainability issues, and all of these have been mentioned again um, but I'll, I'll give you my, my perspective on each of these. And uh, if I have a little time at the end, I'll touch just a little bit on algae. The question mark is both because I'm not sure I'll have time and because I'm not sure how promising algae is in the, in the, certainly in the current state, but maybe in the longer term. Uh, I won't spend time on this because you've seen it um, already, but it's, this is, I, I think the, this is global primary energy use, and uh, when you're dealing with energy, you have to be careful about distinguishing primary versus secondary versus final energy, and the distributions will look quite different. I think Charlie in his slides yesterday showed final energy use. This is primary energy, and you can see that biomass uh, is about 10% of total global primary energy use today, and it's split about equally between traditional and modern bioenergy. And the total in terms of exajoules is about, about 60 exajoules per year of bioenergy that's used in all forms. And if you compare that with how much biomass is produced on the earth every year, it's quite a small, small fraction, so something like 2,000 exajoules. And the tale of two cities is, is, is this, these two cities here, traditional and modern, right? So this is the, one of the, the poorer city where biomass is used in, in traditional ways. And this is the fraction, this, the data is about 10 years old now, but this is the fraction of uh, residential energy that's, that's biomass in different um, parts of the world. And you can see in, in parts of Africa, 
uh, the majority, most of the energy in, used in the homes is, is bio, bi, uh, traditional biomass uh, and, and other regions also. And what this, the consequences of this are that you have serious health, uh, indoor air pollution damage, um, and particularly for women and children, and it's estimated that some three million, close to three million premature deaths a year because of the way biomass is used in, in indoors. And it also results in uh, reduced opportunities for more productive activities, either education or income earning. Um, and again, it particularly affects women and children. So, so this is the, the sort of the dark side, I would say, of, of, uh, of bioenergy. So modernizing bioenergy, um, in, if, to, be, to begin to think about that, you have to start with photosynthesis, which is um, what creates the, creates the biomass to begin with. And this comparison of different um, renewable energy sources, and this is now for electricity production, uh, the amount of electricity, the, the amount of land that you need per megawatt of, of electric power generation. And um, with biomass, it's something like on the order of 200 to 300, depending on what technologies you're using, hectares per megawatt of power generation. And that's much higher than solar, uh, much higher than wind. With hydro, if you're putting a dam in the Amazon, you might be uh, on the high side here, but it, in most hydro cases, it's quite small as well. So this is for electricity production. This is if you're making hydrogen fuel. So you can, you can use any of these sources to make hydrogen as a, as a say, a transportation fuel. And the same kind of comparisons, the number, the amount of land that you need is much higher with biomass. And that, and that of course, leads, has many, many consequences that we've heard about um, already in yesterday and this morning. Um, so how efficiently, and Charlie showed some numbers, I'm going to give you my my uh, take on how you go through the uh, in estimating the efficiency of solar energy. Um, so here's the reaction that turns uh, water and CO2 into glucose and oxygen and spits out some additional water. Um, so what's interesting here is you can see that you're, you, you start with 12 molecules of, of water, but you, don't, you end up sort of not using six of them. And, but those six are required so in order to make this process work. And so you have a lot of water requirements uh, in, this, in this process. And we'll get into some of the details of that uh, as we go along. So plants uh, of the sunlight coming in, they only use what's called the photosynthetic, photosynthetically active radiation. That's basically the visible light from 0.4 to 0.7 microns. And PAR accounts for about half of the incoming sunlight. So plants use only about half of the, of the incoming solar energy. And they don't use 100% of it. They only absorb about 80% of it. So you can see we're starting to reduce from 100% from of solar energy coming down to the earth. We're starting to reduce the amount that gets, ends up being stored in the biomass. So the glucose that's formed here contains about almost 30% of the absorbed photon energy. So again, we're losing um, an, uh, some additional amount of, of energy there. And then of the energy that's stored as glucose, about 40% of it is used for what's called dark respiration. That's at nighttime, you re-release um, uh, some of that energy to keep the the metabolism going. And so the maximum photosynthetic efficiency, you can just go through and do the, do the math with each of these numbers, um, and you come out with about 6 to 7 percent efficient uh, conversion of sunlight at the surface of the Earth to, to stored glucose or biomass energy. Now, this, is, this relates primarily to um, what's called C4 plants. So C4 plants are those where the, where the, uh, the first photosynthetic product is a four carbon sugar instead of a, uh, a three carbon sugar. And these the C4 plants are things like sugarcane and corn and sorghum that grow 
best in hot climates. If you think about C3 plants, um, which are grasses and trees primarily, uh, this, that makes up about 95% of the biomass around the world. Um, the maximum storage efficiency there uh, is about half of what it is for uh, C4 plants. All right. So, so with this efficiency number, we can do some interesting little calculations. So if you take a, what's the, the you ask the question, what, how much biomass could we make at a, at a spot on Earth um, given this kind of efficiency? And I picked an example of in the UK, which is at about a 50 degree north latitude. And the average incident solar energy at the surface is about 11 megajoules per square meter per day. Um, you do the math, 11 megajoules per square meter per day, convert that at 3.3% efficiency, and you get about 1,300 gigajoules per hectare per year. Right. So that number probably doesn't mean much to most of you. It doesn't mean much to me unless I see something to compare it against. So biomass typically is going to have a, an energy content of roughly eight, 17 to 18 gigajoules per dry ton. And so with this many gigajoules per hectare, you get about 76 dry tons per hectare per year is what you would expect for a, a maximum um, biomass production in, at this spot in the UK. If you look at another, another place uh, closer to my home, this is in Iowa, which is in the middle of the United States, which is the big corn growing part of the United States. Um, it's at a lower, whoops, it's a lo lower latitude, has, a, has some additional uh, solar energy coming down on average, and so we, we would expect something like 100 tons per hectare per year that we could produce in Iowa. So let's compare this number to what we actually produce in Iowa, the corn growing capital of, of the US. So this is, this is the corn grain yield in kilograms per hectare over time in Iowa, and you could probably show graphs like this for sugarcane in Brazil or Colombia or other places. And it's been steadily climbing for various reasons through various genetic modifications, through fertilizer um, applications and so on. Um, and we're up to, uh, up to in as of 2010, it was about eight dry tons per hectare per year of corn grain, which is what is measured typically. And there's roughly a ton of, of uh, what's called corn stover, the fiber that goes with the corn grain per ton of grain. So that means a total above ground biomass production of about 16 tons per hectare per year. Yes? Sorry, you got a microphone here. We're gonna make these guys work uh, this time. Thank you. My name is Diana. I'm from Colombia. I'm sorry, can you go back uh, one slide, please? I, I feel like a little loose when you talk about energy. Do you mean this energy? It's for when you burn, burn the, uh, when you use the dry bi biomass for burn and produce electricity, or this energy is related uh, with, uh, uh, is related about what? I didn't understand that, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's the heating value of the, of the biomass, the raw biomass. So if you burn that completely, you would release that amount of heat, it, right? Other questions? Okay, uh, this heating value, uh, it's, it's the heating value after or before you vaporize all the water? So that's a good question, and this is a question that most people who first encounter biomass don't uh, consider seriously enough, right? So biomass, when you cut it fresh, it has about 50% water in it. Sugarcane, maybe more. Um, but you can dry the water out, and right? So, so the, the, this heating value, I've expressed it in per dry ton, okay? So it could have half water in it, but this is per dry ton. So you just you have to specify what the 
uh, moisture content is that you're referring to when you... So uh, this dry tone there doesn't have any water? Right. If you, if you, well, if you took a piece of biomass and dried it completely, uh, okay. this would be what the energy that would be released. But it's a way of talking about the same piece of biomass even with the water in it. That okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Another one. Um, hello. It's about the next slide. About the yeah. So you said like we are producing more uh, per hectare, but in the same time, like, are you considering that there is more inputs, more fertilizer? Um, so this is just strictly how much how much uh, biomass is being produced above ground. Yeah, but now we, in 2005, I think we, we are producing more, but we are also putting more fertilizer and more inputs. Yes. So, so at the end, the energy balance, I don't know if it's still the same. Well, so, so here I'm just, I'm, it's a good question, and I'll come back to the energy balance with fertilizer later. But right now, I wanted to, to illustrate how, um, so, So I wanted you to keep this number in your head, that, that there are 100, you would expect 100 tons per hectare per year to be producible on sort of maximum efficiency in Iowa. But what we're actually producing is about 16, even with all of this effort to, to add fertilizer and so on. So we're only producing 16 instead of 100. So a factor of 10 below the maximum efficiency, which is already rather low. Um, and so the question is, what are we missing in this calculation of the photosynthetic efficiency? What have I, what have I not taken into account here? Any thoughts? Uh, right, so that the area is not completely covered, meaning the canopy of the biomass is not occupying every square meter. That's, it, that's part of it. Yep. What else? Should, should I, should we have the mic? Okay. Um, it was more like a question whether the phot photosynthesis happens on the whole plant or on the specific parts of it. Well, that, that would be similar to the canopy yeah. cover, I think. It's, is, are you intercepting all of the solar energy or only part of it? So if you have a very thin plant or a very broad one, the broad one will collect more solar energy, right? So that's, so the canopy cover is an important piece. Any other suggestions? The lifetime. 24 hours, right. You, 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 you're, you're, um, well, let's see, the, the solar, the average solar incidence, right, it's, Just like when you make a calculation, usually you, if uh, photosynthesis is efficient, you count like 24 hours, like hours have light and not the, right, not right. the real thing. And even, uh, so yeah, so related to that the, the, is the temperature also. There are parts of the year where the temperature is not warm enough to grow things, so, yeah. right? So I'll, I'll give you the five factors that I, uh, low temperatures, so below about five degrees C, you can't grow something. So we, we, that maximum calculation assumed we were getting solar energy um, year round and plants could grow year round. If we don't have enough water, um, we're not gonna be able to, to photosynthesize effectively. Nutrients, um, fertilizer and so on. You'll have insects and diseases that will will uh, cut down on the amount of um, produc production, and then the incomplete canopy closure, which was the one that you had mentioned. Um, so there are many things that reduce the maximum theoretical efficiency of biomass production. And so if we look at just temperature alone, so let's say that in, in the temperate regions that I was talking about in, in the UK and in Iowa, you have maybe a five-month 
period where you can actually have warm enough temperatures to grow things. Um, it also happens that the solar radiation is much stronger in those months, um, so you have more solar energy input. Um, so you're taking that into account, um, you would have, say, a maximum production of 76 tons per hectare per year, but we're going to have much more sunlight coming in, but we're only going to have it for part of the year. And we end up with 50 tons per hectare per year just, just by the growing season has cut by one third the, from the maximum, right? And in Des Moines, Iowa, the same kind of calculation, we go from 100 tons down to 60 tons, right? <coughs> so, there we go. Overall, with practical considerations, you think the battery might be done? Okay, we'll struggle along here. So in so with practical considerations, it's about 1% efficiency for C3 plants and maybe 2 to 3% uh, for C4 plants. All right, so we're struggling. We're struggling to, uh, against photosynthetic efficiency when we're working with biomass. Okay. All right, so... On top of that, then we have to look at, at what kind of land is suitable for growing biomass. And uh, this is um, a map that shows um, where you have enough rain to grow, to grow crops of some sort, um, and you have the right kind of soils and climate generally. Um, so the, the, the yellow is unsuited for agriculture, so you have deserts, for example, that are not, you can't grow things there. Um, you have closed forests like the Amazon and, and in sub-Saharan Africa, there are large places uh, where you don't want to grow. Um, and so you're left with the, the sort of the blue and the green areas is a much smaller fraction of the, of the earth's land that's available for growing things than, than we might like. And so if you think about trying to provide all of the energy that we use in the world from, from biomass, we, total primary energy consumption in the, U in the world is about 600 exajoules per year. Everybody know what an exajoule is? 10 to the 18th, right. It's a big number, okay. Um, so if we, if we uh, make, were to produce biomass at say an average of 15 tons per hectare per year, we would need about two and a half billion hectares of land to supply our, all of our primary energy needs. And globally, we, the total land area is about 13 billion. The amount of cropland that we have today is about a billion and a half. Uh, forests are about four billion, and then permanent pasture is about three billion. So it's... Um, it's infeasible that we're going to supply all of our energy at the rate that we use it today from biomass. Um, but there are ways that we can be smart about um, using biomass, be efficient about it, and we can also importantly reduce this number uh, with the efficiency of how we use energy. So um, it's not going to, biomass won't save the world in terms of energy, but it can have an important role to play. So the, source, the sources of biomass that, that um, is, I, I use the term first generation and second generation slightly differently than Charlie did, and I don't think there's a standard definition here, but I, first generation I refer to as uh, uh, depend, depending on the, uh, the source of the biomass. So first generation is basically uh, food, food biomass, and second generation is lignocellulosic non-food biomass, right? So with food biomass, you really, it's been optimized over time for food production, not for energy production. And so it's, it works for food, uh, for energy, but it's really been optimized for food. Um, and, and in the case of sugarcane in Brazil, that's starting to change a little bit because of the, the big ethanol program here. You can 
there are probably varieties of cane that are more optimized for um, ethanol than for, for sugar. But in, in the end, we're only converting a portion of the plant in most cases. For example, in, in the U.S., it's corn ethanol primarily. We're only converting the corn. We're, we're leaving half of the biomass on the land or doing something else with it. Um, so it's not, again, not optimized. Um, and then we're competing with, with, um, um, with food. And so that can lead to higher cost bioenergy and higher cost food. And so ultimately, I, I consider most first generation biomass sources as not sustainable for, for, for these reasons. Um, and I would make an exception for sugarcane in, in, in Brazil for sure. Second generation is uh, lignocellulosic, and these are generally not edible, and so um, there's less competition with food. Um, on the same token, the reason they're not edible is because they're difficult to digest, which makes it harder to convert into to energy in, in, in some cases. Um, but we do use most of the plant for, for energy, so we're getting better use out of the land. Um, and we can customize the plants to, to for, en for energy, optimize them for energy rather than for uh, other purposes. So these, I would say, are easier to make sustainable. They're not automatically sustainable, but they're easier to, to make sustainable. So um, this is kind of a, a map of the sustainable sources of biomass, sort of a simplified look at it. This is from the Global Energy Assessment and incidentally, on all of, I try on all of my slides to give you the references, so if you're interested, you can, can uh, follow up and find, find the original material. Um, so this is, uh, um, for example, land that's used to make food or, or fodder. Fodder is animal feed. Um, uh, some of that, uh, the harvest of that food can result in residues that become usable for energy. Um, some of that goes to, to, um, uh, for food and animal production and so on, but you could have secondary residues coming out and being used for energy. Um, you have food consumption, which can generate some waste um, and end up with additional residues for energy. And so we've, we've, we've seen examples of all of these from Swanee and Charlie already. You can have pastures where, uh, that are used for animal feed um, but then you also have abandoned agricultural land that is no longer suitable for, for agriculture, um, basically because it, it's, been, it's, its productivity has been exhausted. Um, but it still can grow something, um, and that could be an energy crop that's, that's used. Um, you can have land that's for forestry, and again, used for fiber production or for wood production, but you can have residues from that, from the harvest process that go to energy. You can have material that's, when you're producing, for example, logs and boards, you produce a lot of sawdust and, and waste uh, wood, which is good for energy. And then similarly, consumption of materials, and you have these primary, secondary, and tertiary residues. These are all, I would say, sustainable. Um, and then you have this other category, both land and sea, um, where you could grow dedicated energy crops. Um, and uh, that's a direct energy, uh, um, a bioenergy source. And this one, de depending on how you do it, um, it may or may not be sustainable. So these generation two feedstocks then, um, so crop residues, primary and secondary, um, it's pretty easy to estimate how much biomass you could get um, from a... Oh, looks like I have a question here. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Um, you are talking about sustainable and unsustainable uh, production in the, the previous slide. What did you mean with, with it? Because uh, at least from the next one, there is uh, some ways to, to make it sustainable. Okay, it would be more difficult, uh, you have more difficulty to, 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 to use uh, res tertiary residues from food, from the population, but it's technical possible, it's, you know, but 
what, what did you mean when you said, okay, it's not sustainable? That's an uh, excellent question, because uh, sustainable means different things to different people, for sure. And uh, I think in this, and, and, and in fact, it's going to mean different things in different parts of my talk. talk. So, but sustainable in this case is, is that you're, this, this is being produced um, regardless of whether you want it for energy or not. It's, there's always a stream of this coming, and so in that sense, it's sustainable here. But, the, but then there are these sustainability metrics that I'll talk about, water and, and land and greenhouse gas emissions and so on which, and economics uh, of, the, of the system that are all also important in terms of being a, a sustainable energy um, carrier in the end. So it's a, it's a complicated term, sustainable. Um, so with crop residues, you can estimate how much, roughly how much um, biomass you can get, um, typically using these residue ratios. So for, for, co for corn, for every, ton of corn grain that you produce, you produce about a ton of, of residue material. For wheat and rice, the numbers are a little bit higher. Uh, and for sugarcane, I think Charlie showed the number um, yesterday. Uh, and uh, forest residues, again, a, a sawmill. How many, how many of you have visited a sawmill? Okay, a sawmill, when you go there, you'll see huge piles of, of scrap wood and sawdust, which is the result of cutting the, the, the tree, and um, that's about as much waste as the final product, so it's a lot of, uh, of uh, biomass available there. Um, and in this case, sustainable would be if the, if the trees are being harvested sustainably and, and renewably, um, then the waste would be considered uh, sustainable. And then you have animal waste, municipal solid waste, and dedicated energy crop production. So these are, these are the sources that most of my uh, work has focused on uh, understanding how to use these kinds of biomass and less, less on the first generation feedstocks. So these are the sustainability issues um, that I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to take my jacket off. Here. So uh, again, you've seen all of these in uh, previous slides from Swanee and Charlie. Um, and I'll just give you my perspective on each of these, starting with water, both quantity of water and quality. So this is just a cartoon that shows sort of the way water flows in a, in a biofuel system. Um, and this is actually from a, a pretty good um, reference that uh, BP, the oil company, actually put out, water in the energy industry. Um, so you have your, your, your biomass growing over here. Your root system might be taking water either from the ground or from irrigation or from uh, precipitation. Um, and then you have, you have to worry about uh, uh, water runoff into the, into the um, surface water bodies. Um, <clears throat> you might be taking water to a treatment plant from those bodies. Um, and using that for your, for your biomass energy conversion. Um, you, send, you send some sort of virtual water out of the conversion plant with the product that you're making. Um, and then your, your biomass is coming in and being converted into, say, fuel. And then you might use some for heat and power generation. Some of the, the water might be recycled, as they do in, in, in Brazil. Um, and put back as irrigation. So you have quite a complex set of flows that you have to worry about, including the groundwater, uh, the groundwater flow. So this is a, a map that shows how much in cubic kilometers per year of water goes in different regions of the world into different activities. So this is agriculture here, this is industry, and this is households. So you can see that the, the largest consumption of water by far is in agriculture. This little piece here is, is biofuels. So biofuels are tiny right now. Um, and the other interesting thing to show here is that the, the color of the, the outflows of water 
represent um, sort of the level of pollution that comes out of these various systems. So um, with, with agriculture, a lot of the water goes back to the atmosphere through tra evapotranspiration. Um, and then a, a, a fair number amount of the water also goes back to the surface, but you can see it's a darker color, meaning it's, it's potentially been uh, contaminated through, for example, n n uh, nitrogen fertilizer and other, other uh, activities in the agricultural sector. With energy, you have uh, primarily the impact is on raising the temperature of the water that you use. Um, and then uh, for, indust for industry and domestic uses, um, you have uh, uh, untreated wastewater can, can go into the surface and so on. So, it's, so right now, biofuels is a tiny piece of this, but locally, of course, it's going to be quite important um, and how it affects water. So I thought it would be useful just to, to have a feel for how plants use water. Um, and that um, we have this water use efficiency term, which is basically it's defined as the amount of biomass that we make per hectare per year divided by the amount of water that's required to do that, evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration means if you put a, a dome over the top of the, uh, my, my pointer is dying a little bit. Is there a, a fresh battery or something? You? No, no, no. The, this, no, no, this, this is dying a little bit. I can't see. Does it have a, is it a battery? No, the pointer. Okay, thank you. Um, so if you put a dome over, the, over this growing plant, you'll have water that's evaporating out of the soil. You have water that, that evaporates, um, transpires through the plant, and then evaporates. And that's, that, all that together is evapotranspiration. Um, and the amount of evapotranspiration um, is is the what's in the denominator here? So how much above ground biomass per evapotranspirated water? And so C3 plants and C4 plants. This is another category of basically desert plants. I won't talk too much about that. But C3 and C4, you can see the above ground productivity is higher for C4, um, and the water use efficiency is higher as well. Okay. And so you can trans translate this water use efficiency into how much water you need um, per hectare per year to grow a, a particular crop. And that's the last number down at the bottom. And the numbers, the numbers are quite uh, large in terms of uh, tons per hectare per year. Great. Thank you. So the, the, there's something called the vapor pressure deficit in a plant, and this is the difference in the, uh, if you, how many of you have had a thermodynamics course? Okay, good. So this is the difference, this is the difference in the, the, the vapor pressure outside the leaf and inside the leaf. And inside the leaf, it's typically saturated with vapor, and so the, the evapotranspiration is driven by the outside relative humidity. So the drier it is outside the leaf, the, the more you're going to uh, evapotranspirate water. And so this vapor pressure deficit is 1 minus the relative humidity times the saturation vapor pressure um, at a given temperature. So this is the, as the temperature goes up, the saturation vapor pressure goes up. So, that, so you have this combination of temperature and relative humidity that determine how the plant is going to uh, evapotranspirate water, and you can see the vapor pressure deficit in different climates. So in the tropical area, it's quite low because it's quite humid outside the leaf as well as inside the leaf, but when you go into drier areas, you get very high vapor pressure deficits, which mean you're going to drive a lot of water through the, through the plant. And you can use this vapor pressure deficit to normalize the water use efficiency. Um, and it lets you then make a better comparison between, say, C3 plants and C4 plants. So the, the, uh, the, the, uh, 
the normalized water use efficiency, these are for different plants, soybeans, canola, wheat, and willow. And the numbers are much closer together than they, than they are for the, without the normalizing factor. Um, so these, these are in different climates. You can see Sweden, Argentina, Australia, and the numbers are quite, quite close together. And so uh, typically around 0 0.05 for this metric. C4 crops, again, in different places, England, Australia, India, US, quite, quite different climates. And, uh, and again, the numbers are relatively close to each other. And you can see that the, the normalized water use efficiency for the C4 plant is maybe twice the, that for the C3 plant. So the, so the C4 plants use water much more efficiently is what the, the bottom line conclusion is here. And so we can use this uh, water use efficiency to help estimate either how much water you need to get a given yield or how much yield you can expect in a given climate. So how much water do we need to produce a given yield of crop? It's evapotranspiration, that's the amount of water we need. This is the yield we want to get, multiplied by the vapor pressure deficit for that region, divided by this normalized water use efficiency. And I just did some examples here. If we wanted to get 18 tons per hectare per year of wheat, which is a, a nice yield of wheat, um, and the vapor pressure, the, the normalized water use efficiency for, for wheat is 0.045 in, in those units. And the growing season vapor pressure deficit in two different places, very different climates, England versus Egypt. You can see the uh, vapor pressure deficit is much higher in Egypt because of the desert-like climate. And so the annual water that you require is going to be on the order of 400 millimeters versus 1,600 millimeters. Right? And so you have to also then look at how much rain you might get um, to understand whether you could have rain-fed wheat production at this level in these places. Another example is miscanthus, which is a an energy, like an energy cane type crop. Um, it's a very fast growing um, grass, very tall grass. Um, and I've looked at two different places in the US, Illinois and Nebraska. So Illinois is, is in the middle here. It's a, it's a very um, rich agricultural region. The Mississippi River runs right down here. Nebraska is a bit to the west, but a much different climate, much drier. And uh, vapor pressure deficit is, is much higher in Nebraska than Illinois. The amount of uh, rainfall that we would need to get a nice uh, yield of miscanthus, 40 tons per hectare per year, is, is half the amount of, of water in Illinois as in Nebraska. But then you compare that with the annual precipitation, and you can see that the rainfall in Nebraska is much less than the water that you would require, whereas in Illinois you have far more water as rainfall than you do um, than you need for this kind of a yield, so you would expect that you could get good yields in Illinois just with rainfall, but in Nebraska, you might need to irrigate to get that so you alternatively, you can ask the question what yield um, should we expect in Nebraska for this miscanthus crop and let's say that the uh, the growing season gets three three hundred out of the four hundred millimeters of rain and uh, we can calculate the yield again from the same equation here, and we would expect something under 10 tons per hectare instead of the 40 that we would like to have. Right. So it's a, it's a quick and easy way to compare um, uh, biomass, uh, water, water requirements for biomass production. So, uh, so Nebraska here, because of this, this deficit of water, this, this applies not only for an energy crop, but it also applies for uh, um, food crop production. And right below Nebraska here is the state of Kansas. And this is a picture from the, a satellite of the Kansas cornlands. And these circles are hard to, it's hard to get a sense of scale, but these are large circles. Um, and they are created by these, these irrigation systems that are called center pivot irrigation, which is, is a water, is a irrigation that's just circling like this around and around. And you get these, these beautiful green 
patches. Um, but it it's requires a lot of water, as you can see. And where does that water come from? Uh, in the case of the U.S., this is we're talking. This is Kansas here and ne Nebraska here. Um, there's a giant underground aquifer, a drink a freshwater aquifer called the Ogallala or the High Plains Aquifer. And this shows the this shows the layout of the aquifer, as well as the annual uh, precipitation that comes with, uh, so this is higher precipitation and this is lower precip precipitation. So this is about 25, uh, it's about 25 um, centimeters per year and this is going to be on the order of maybe 40 or, 40 or 50 centimeters per year. So that's what recharges the aquifer. Over here it's hard to see, you can't really read it very well, but what this shows the, the, the redder the area, the more the level of the aquifer has dropped over time. And it's, uh, I can't read the numbers myself, but it's, it's dramatic reduction in the level of the aquifer. So basically in order to, to, do, the, to do this irrigation, we're, we're, mining, we're mining water, fresh water, and not not recharging it rapidly enough. So this is this is the concern when you're doing irrigation is that you're going to run out of uh, water resources. And this this goes beyond even the economics. If you look at the economics of irrigation for energy for energy crops, it's going to be very challenging. So in general, to be a sustainable um, uh, energy bioenergy system, you you're going to want to uh, not use irrigation. And then the other issue that comes with water is that you're, um, you have nutrient runoff. And, and again, this is, um, this is a food crop uh, uh, somewhere probably near the Mississippi River in, in the US. Um, but you're getting runoff of, of potentially of nutrients like nitrogen fertilizer. And you, you have a couple of risks with this. You can, you can uh, uh, contaminate the, sh the shallow drinking water, and Suwani talked about this as, a, as an issue with fert irrigation, that there are limits on how much fert irrigation is used um, so as to avoid contaminating shallow drinking water. We have the same, same kind of issue in the United States. All of this area here is where um, you have high level of nitrogen inputs. So the red is high inputs of nitrogen, um, and the the, uh, you also have a high vulnerability of, of groundwater contamination. And this is the, the agricultural region, the main agricultural region in the U.S., so a lot of it is at risk of this kind of contamination. And then you have a, sort of an even larger scale problem. If you look at the, this is the Mississippi drainage basin. So this is the Mississippi River here, and it drains all of this land all of that it flows into the Mississippi River, and then that dumps out into the Gulf of Mexico. So you have the Ohio River here, which is a major river. You have the Missouri River here, and all of these concentrate. And so it, this is basically the agricultural basin of the U.S., and it looks sort of like a uh, inside of a body maybe with with blood vessels flowing. But you can see it all concentrates here, and this is the nitrogen inputs that come from agriculture. Um, and you can see it's mostly con the most concentrated here. This is in kilograms per square meter per year. Um, but it comes from all over this region and it all flows. Anything that runs off that doesn't get used by the plants goes uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see this red formation here, um, hypoxia, which is the over nutrients in the, uh, too much nutrients being supplied into the Gulf of Mexico and creating algae. Uh, algae blooms, which then cause uh, uh, die off of fish and other other ecological problems. So this is a this is a big problem with agriculture. And again, if we're talking about bioenergy, we need to be worried about these kinds of things so that they're they're not um, um, they don't happen. Um, okay, so that was water and and nutrients related to water, um, land use change, and greenhouse gas emissions. I have a question here. There you go. Um, thanks, Professor. My name is Raquel. I'm here from Brazil. 
And about the water, I've heard someone saying that it's very critical. We are trying to change, like genetic modification for, for instance, like the water, um, the loss heat and like the water, heat, the the water loss from the plant, so we can increase the productivity without using many water, especially in the dry place. So I would like to know your 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 thought on that. Like, do you think that genetic manipulation can offer to us like some sort of solution, and or if you have done much of of could do, or if you have like m more room to improve, what's your your opinion on that? That's a, a good question. I I'm not an expert on that. Um, I I know that there are people who are thinking about that kind of strategy. Um, yeah. So I, but I hesitate to to uh, give an answer um, just because I'm not informed on it. I think the sort of from a higher level, the concern when you start start changing the, the genetics of the plant, people worry about about sort of wild plants getting, or, or genetically modified plants getting out into the wild and creating other issues. So there's always, always unintended consequences, I think. But that is one direction I think people are working on to try to improve the water use efficiency. Yeah. Okay, land use change and greenhouse gas emissions. This is a uh, quite an interesting um, area and a lot of thinking and writing and differences of, of, opi of opinion among different people. This I'm going to start with, there's direct land use change and then there's indirect land use change. So direct land use change is if you take a piece of land that is being used for some purpose today and you change to uh, use it for bioenergy. So um, there's several different systems that have been shown, that are shown here. This is work that was done, was published in Science a few years ago, um, and uh, it, drew, it helped draw attention to the, to the issues of land use change with bioenergy. But, um, so these are, for example, palm biodiesel, um, and the, the, if you change the ecosystem from, a, say, a tropical rainforest and change it to palm biodiesel, and this is in Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia, then the amount of carbon that you emit because you basically cut the forest is, is uh, shown here, both um, above ground biomass carbon loss and below ground biomass carbon loss. So there's carbon in the soil which can be released to the atmosphere. So that's, by cutting the forest, that's how much um, carbon you release, and the idea is that you if you have a biofuel, you're going to displace fossil fuels, and so you'll save fossil fuel emissions. And how long will it take you before you've um, paid back this carbon debt, essentially? Right? Is that clear? So, so in the case, in this case, um, you have a carbon debt of about, uh, say, 700 tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare, um, and the time it takes is, is it's going to be 86 years before you pay that all back, before you get back to neutral, right? So after 86 years, if you're still using that land for biofuel, then you're starting to get benefits on the carbon side. And it, depending on what type of biofuel and what type of ecosystem you change, um, you can have very different um, carbon debt um, uh, periods. And in general, um, so these are mostly first generation, um, and I'm sure I'll, ha I'll have a heated discussion about this one with Suani or, or Cortez. Um, this is if you take Cerrado in Brazil and uh, turn it into uh, sugarcane ethanol land, the, the estimate is about a 17-year um, carbon debt. Um, but again, the, the, the point here is that you have to look carefully at the, in, at the specifics of the situation that you're dealing with. Out here, um, uh, this is a case where we're using marginal or abandoned cropland. 
Um, so a lot of, there's a lot of, and I'll show you some numbers on this, there's a lot of abandoned cropland around the world. And if you do that, this is very poor. There's, there's very little biomass on it to begin with, and there's not much carbon in the soil, so there isn't too much that you can, you can have in the way of a debt. Um, and, and essentially the payback time is, is immediate. Right? So, it's a, it's a, so that from a direct land use change standpoint, this is, is quite an attractive um, an option. So Suani has something to say. Sorry to interrupt, uh, just a, a small question. Uh, of course, you are considering the worst case where we are doing deforestation to plant the crops. And, and at least in Brazil, the environmental legislation does not allow that. You cannot make deforestation to plant any crop. Uh, but in this case, also if you do the deforestation, f even if it's not for biofuels and if it is for food, you have also the problem of carbon emissions. I mean, in Malaysia, when they did deforestation to plant palm oil for food, uh, the, you have the same problem, is that so? Or if you plant sugar cane for sugar production, uh, and if you do deforestation, you also have the negative impact. So better never to make deforestation at not at all, is that so? Just a question. Yes, exactly, yeah. Deforestation is not something you want to do, and or in general, changing a native ecosystem, whether it's 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 uh, forests or savanna. Um, yeah. So, so the uh, the point uh, the the authors of this particular work they were they actually were doing work on this idea of of using abandoned lands. This is Dave Tillman at the University of Minnesota. So they were a little bit. And when you read the literature on biofuels, you have to be careful about the biases that are here. Um, so they, they were perhaps skewing the analysis a bit to, to sort of favor their, their results. Um, but this is a potentially an interesting um, resource. And this is around the world. There's something like 450 million hectares of this land, which, which has been abandoned because it's no longer productive. And if you can plant. Uh, if you can establish a perennial uh, crop on this kind of land, even if it's low productivity above ground, you can get uh, a lot of root biomass generated, and it's perennial, so you're not harvesting the, uh, the whole plant every year. You're, you're letting it grow back every year. You can end up building carbon into the soil, and over uh, on the order of decades, 50, 60, 70 years, you can bring, begin to bring that soil back into productive uh, purpose and, for example, for food agriculture. So this is one idea that people are, have been looking at. We've done a little bit of looking at the possibilities here. The trouble with this is that the, the yield above, above ground, because the soil is not very productive, the yield above ground is quite low, and that makes the economics quite challenging. So that was, that's direct land use change that I was talking about. Then there's a second category called indirect land use change, and this one is even even more contentious than the direct land use change. And this was, uh, Suwani mentioned this fellow's name, Searchinger, um, and he's the one who first called the world's attention to this, and he happens to be also at Princeton University. Um, and so I know, I know Tim, and he's a very passionate guy, and he's been very successful, I would say, in, in getting the ear of a lot of, of policymakers, uh, particularly in, in Europe. But the, the basic issue here is that if you uh, take a piece of agricultural land, let's say in the U.S., corn growing land, that corn was used for food and now we're going to convert it to ethanol instead, that food demand, the food that was produced has to be produced somewhere else. And, and Searchinger's argument was that, you know, it could be deforestation somewhere in the rest of the world that is done in order to grow more corn. And that deforestation has carbon emissions. And so that was, that's the, the basic idea of indirect land use change, is that when you do something in one place, it has an effect somewhere else. And you know, the, basic, the basic concept is correct, um, and the basic argument is generally accepted, but it's a very difficult one to quantify. You, can't, you cannot um, uh, experimentally determine what happened. You have to use models to say what happens in the agricultural system if, 
for example, half of the corn in the U.S. Gets, starts to be used for ethanol, what happens in the rest of the world? And there are many different models that are used. And uh, um, you won't be able to read this very easily, but the idea here is that you can get just about any result that you want, depending on um, what kind of model you use and what kind of assumptions you put into it. So this is, um, these are different biofuels. This is corn ethanol here. Um, this is, I think, wheat ethanol and so on. And if we just take one of these, and this is uh, grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of biofuel. So it's, the, it's essentially the amount of carbon emissions that we get per, um, per, per unit of uh, biofuel that we make. And you can see that depending on where you are on the scale, you can be, uh, and I, somewhere around here is where fossil fuels would be. So, so you can see that there, uh, you have to be uh, very, you have to understand how the model was done, what the assumptions were in order to be able to really assess whether the results make sense or not. And in the case of the, the way the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency does it is to, um, they just regulate and they say um, a, uh, the indirect land use change impact is X of say corn ethanol or, or soy biodiesel and they just, uh, they've looked at the models and made some decision about what the number is to use and that, that's the way uh, the, that, that's the way the bioenergy industry has to deal with it. Jose, how am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. Is that, so the indirect land use change, this is this is one of the most contentious issues in the, in the bioenergy area. All right, uh, energy and greenhouse gas balances now with, and let's leave out the land use change. Um, let's say we have second generation bio, biomass. Um, this is from some work that, that I did a few years ago. Um, I'm showing the energy balances and the greenhouse gas balances for producing um, two different biomass second generation biomass feedstocks. This is corn stover, which is the fiber from corn production. And this is uh, mixed prairie grasses. So it's the, this idea of the abandoned croplands growing multiple species of, of native, essentially native grasses to try to restore the land. And I've shown the energy balances here and the greenhouse balances here. So let's start with corn stover. Um, so the energy balance Overall, it requires about 1.1 gigajoules per dry ton of stover delivered. That's the amount of energy that we need to, to, cult, to harvest it, to collect it, to bale it, and to take it to the, to the conversion facility. And you can see that uh, almost half of the energy input is to replace the fertilizer that you, uh, to, to, to add fertilizer that you need because you've taken away some of the nutrients with the, with the fiber rather than leaving the fiber on the field. So that's an important piece. And then transportation is important. And then some collection and baling of the material. Um, and in the greenhouse gas balance is, is, is similar, um, and, but the fertilizer replacement is even larger here um, because of the fact that you when you add nitrogen fertilizer, you get N2O emissions coming off the field, and N2O is much more powerful as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, so, you, so that becomes the most important piece there. In the mixed prairie grasses now, it's, it, there's no fertilizer requirement because we're, we're reestablishing a native species without fertilization. So the most important energy contributor is, is transportation. Um, and overall, the total is about turns out to be about the same uh, um, for per gig, uh, gigajoules per dry ton. And then the greenhouse gas uh, distribution is almost exactly the same as the energy distribution. So the, the conclusion out of this graph is that corn stover, the fertilizer replacement is most important. For the mixed prairie grasses, this was the way we did this analysis. We, we assumed that the grasses would be grown on what's called conservation reserve land, which is land that is specifically designated as not being um, u allowed to be used for agriculture because it has certain character uh, for annual agriculture, but you, you are allowed to plant grasses on it. So 
this land is, is rather dispersed and spread out, so that's why the transportation costs are quite large. Um, but these numbers, so this is kilograms of CO2 per dry ton. Um, it's about twice per dry ton for corn stover as mixed prairie grasses, but, but we don't really, we, we need to compare these numbers to something to understand whether these are large or, or not. And so what we can do is look at the energy content of biomass and the carbon content of biomass that we're producing. So each dry ton makes about 18, has about 18 gigajoules of energy in it. And you compare that with about one, one gigajoule that we need to, to produce that ton. So that's a pretty, pretty good energy balance there. Not very much in, this is mostly fossil energy um, and this is biomass energy. Um, and then it's similarly for the emissions um, again, these numbers, 84 and 160, are much smaller than the carbon that we've taken out of the atmosphere by, uh, uh, by growing the biomass. So, these are, so the energy balance and the, and the greenhouse balances for these second generation, second generation uh, feedstocks is quite good. Right. Any questions at this point? Okay. We'll keep going. Um, all right, economics. So this is where I think ultimately is if, if the economics don't work, then the system is not sustainable, right? So uh, can't quite see the so that so this is uh, the the scale here is U.S. dollars per liter gasoline equivalent. This is a pretty complicated graph. I'm going to take a little time to explain it. So it shows um, different. Um, different biofuels. First, these are first generation biofuels. So this is sugarcane ethanol in Brazil. This is sugar beet ethanol in the European Union. This is corn ethanol in the US. This is wheat ethanol in, in the EU, biodiesel in the European Union, and uh, soy, soy biodiesel in Brazil. And for each, each of these fuels, there's two different years of data shown, 2004 and 2007. Um, and the, the numbers haven't changed too much um, since then. But the, 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 the point here is, is, is uh, the same. So we've shown uh, this pink uh, area here is feedstock costs. The, the green is co-product value. So we're, this is the walking stick that Cortez was talking about. Um, that, that's a reven it's a revenue source. Um, and then the processing cost, this is the conversion of the feedstock into the biofuel. Uh, and then this is the energy costs um, uh, for the processing. And, and then the, this shows the net cost. So it's, the, it's all of the positive costs minus the, the walking stick revenue. And then the green bar in the middle here is what the fossil fuel price was in 2004, or the, basically the oil price in 2004 versus 2007. Um, 2004, it was about $40 a barrel of oil for crude, and 2007 was about $70 a barrel for crude. So what do we take away from all of this uh, information? These are things that, that Cortez said yesterday much more eloquently than I am. Um, but feedstock is the main cost component, all right? So that's, that's this piece here. In all cases, that's much bigger than the processing costs or the energy costs. So that's an important observation. So feed first, again, these are first generation feed uh, biofuels. The, first, the feedstock cost is the most important. The co-product values, the walking stick, is also important because in, in some cases it's more important than others. Um, the other is that the feedstock cost is highly variable. So, so this is two different years of production, and the, in this case, it's uh, corn in the U.S. So the corn price is almost double here what it was here. So, you, so, so you're subject to the fluctuations of the commodity food markets, essentially, is what this is saying. Um, and then, perhaps most importantly, that most of these biofuels are not competitive uh, with, with fossil alternatives without subsidy. So, so this is the fossil energy price. This is the, the biofuel cost. Um, 
here and here, here and here. The only place where it makes some sense is, is Brazilian uh, ethanol, where the ethanol cost is comparable to or less than the, the um, fossil fuel cost. Um, and so the, the re the, from this graph, you can understand why biofuels get subsidized uh, heavily um, in, in the European Union and uh, in the U.S. as well, although the U.S. has started to decline a bit, but not in Brazil anymore because they don't need the subsidies, right? So that's, that's so I, this, is, this is probably my main argument for why first-generation biofuels are not sustainable, is that you can't continue to subsidize and, and grow an industry big enough to make a big impact. So second-generation biomass now. So this was from a, that same study that I referred to earlier that we did. We looked at um, what the cost of delivering, uh, and this is in dollars per ton, mixed prairie grasses or corn stover. And there are, there are many different um, steps in the process to deliver the uh, feedstocks to, um, to a conversion facility. And what we ended up with was a total cost in dollars per gigajoule of about 3.8, close to $4 a gigajoule for corn stover, and, and a higher cost for the mixed prairie grasses, again, because of the low yields that we were getting there, about $7 a gigajoule. Um, those, again, those numbers probably don't mean anything uh, without some comparisons. So crude oil at $70 a barrel is about $12 a gigajoule. Okay, so these look pretty, pretty good compared to crude oil. But in the U.S., natural gas and coal cost about $3 a gigajoule. Um, and natural gas is a much easier feedstock to use for just about anything than, than solid biomass. Um, so the feedstock is more convenient and cheaper um, than, than corn stover. So that's, it's a hard, even before you start to convert the, um, before you start to convert the biomass, it's a challenge to, to see that the economics are going to be very attractive, at least in the, in the U.S. context, right? Um, the other thing that we did in this study was to look at how the scale of the facility, of the conversion, would affect the, the cost. So there are scale economies. The, the bigger you build things, the less it costs per unit of production generally. And so we looked at what the delivery cost would be for biomass at, at a delivery rate. So this number here is for a delivery rate of a million tons per year of biomass, which is a large, there are facilities today that bring a million tons per year um, to a, a conversion facility. Uh, but we looked at, at a half a million tons, two million tons, three million tons. And so the cost does go up as you get larger but the question is whether the conversion facility cost comes down more rapidly as you get larger and larger. Um, and so you have this kind of a trade-off. You have the cost, so this is the cost of a biofuel production, say dollars per liter of production. And the biomass is increasing in cost because you're, you're bringing more and more from further and further away but your capital cost is coming down for the facility at some rate. And so if you put the two together, you have some kind of a, a minimum um, cost here that is at, corresponds to a particular facility size, right? And um, this is a characteristic of second generation uh, conversion processes is that the capital cost is much higher, generally much higher than the first generation conversion. Again, because you're dealing with a, uh, a non-food crop that's harder to convert, essentially. All right. So the, in our study, what we found is that if you um, continue to go out here in, in, with the biomass transportation, you actually, this, this line actually keeps going down, the blue one. It doesn't, it doesn't hit an optimum until you're very, very large. Um, oops, and... Uh, in fact, um, I've shown here how many trucks per hour you would have to unload in order to supply this biomass. And as you get to 3 million tons, you're unloading 23 trucks per hour, which is probably not feasible, right? So you're, you're limited more on, not on the 
um, getting to an economic optimum, you're limited on how much traffic congestion you would have um, at, a, uh, at a conversion facility. But this is an important characteristic to keep in mind that, that, um, that second generation plants want to be larger to uh, have uh, better ec economics. Um, so, yeah, higher capital costs than first generation, but lower feedstock costs. Um, and the costs are more sensitive to scale, so economies are generally optimized. Economics are generally optimized at larger scale. All right, so um, I'm not going to talk too much about conversion technologies themselves because Charlie covered that pretty well yesterday, but this is my uh, sort of overview of it. Um, we have... Um, Second generation feedstocks, these are first generation feedstocks. You can put them through various processes that Charlie talked about and then make different types of energy. Um, low carbon electricity you can make in a lot of different ways. Um, you don't have to use biomass. And since we, since we, we are constrained in the way, uh, the amount of biomass that we can produce in the world, um, it might be better to save that for transportation fuels that, ha that contain carbon and particularly things like jet fuel, which, which is it's going to be hard to electrify airplanes, um, and we may need the fuel for that. So these are the kinds of systems that we've been studying at, at, in my group over the years, um, sort of advanced. I won't go through the details of these. Um, if you're a chemical engineer, you might love to, to dive into some of this stuff. But this is, a, for example, this is a gasification process where you take the biomass and you you gasify it in oxygen, and Charlie talked about this yesterday. You clean up the gas, and then you put it through a fischer trope synthesis process, which, as Charlie mentioned, was, was used back in World War II and before, um, but it makes a synthetic diesel or gasoline. You can also have some byproduct that is used to make power. Um, and this also has the possibility of capturing, removing CO2 and capturing that. And I'll talk more about that uh, idea tomorrow. But, uh, but this gasification process, um, there's been a lot, of, a lot of work done to try to understand what the costs of this kind of a system would be. If you, if you, if you had a, a demand um, and you, could, you had a, uh, a reasonable price that you could get for the, for the, uh, the fuels and uh, but the problem is that mo there haven't been any of these plants built, and so the costs are very uncertain. And I, this is a, a graph that was in a paper a couple of years ago. This is the cost of, for this gasification-based uh, conversion of either biomass or coal. You can use that gasification process for either. Um, and you can see, so the biomass to liquids is the, these guys. Coal to liquids is these guys. And so these are just different estimates that have been made, all for the same size of input of biomass, and you can see it, it's anywhere from 0.5 to almost 3. Um, so nobody really knows what these things are going to cost until we start getting more experience to build them. So you have to be, be very careful when, when, when people tell you that something's going to cost, you know, it's going to be too cheap to believe it probably uh, will be unbelievable. But there is learning that goes on, and uh, Suwani talked about this a bit. Um, as you produce more and more of, a, of something, your costs are going to come down per unit for that. And this is a, is a general, a general uh, learning. I won't go through the details of it, but here's an example. Maybe you'll hear more about this tom um, tomorrow is the wind energy, right? Yeah, so this is, this is the cost of, of wind turbines in dollars per kilowatt over time, and um, both time and the cumulative installed capacity. So the more wind turbines that were built, the, m the, the more the companies figured out how to make it cheaper and cheaper. And so as you, as you build more and more, the cost comes down, and it turns out that it, you can plot this on a log plot and get a straight line. And roughly for mass-produced widgets, which is something that you can make in a factory, um, you get about a 20% cost reduction for every doubling of cumulative production. So that's kind of a general rule for things like, uh, you know, laptop computers and small devices. Wind turbines are sort of modular that way. Um, but it turns out that um, 
in Brazil, the ethanol industry has shown a similar kind of learning because there's been so much, um, so much um, production that has gone on. This is the cost of, of ethanol, um, conver uh, the conversion plants, and it's about a 19% cost reduction per doubling in the cumulative production. So there's been a lot of learning that has gone on, and it's, it seems like it's still continuing, potentially. This is, this is actually the learning that has gone on with sugarcane production. So the cost of making sugarcane has come down as well, even faster than, than this. So there is, there is um, uh, evidence that if, if once we start doing something, we do get better at it and, and learn how to make it cheaper. And that's going to be es essential for second generation um, biofuels. There's also lessons that go the other way. This is kind of an extreme one, but nuclear power uh, in, the, in the US and in France, this is dollars per kilowatt of nuclear um, power plant capacity. And it costs have actually been going up with time because of the special features of nuclear. So it's not, it's not an automatic that the costs will come down. Um, in general, the more complicated the technology, the less likely the costs are to come down but something to keep in mind. Do I have time to talk about algae? Huh? Yeah, okay, I gotta, I gotta talk about algae, so. This is only two slides, all right. So question, question mark about algae. So there's good news and not so good news is my, sorry. <laughs> um, so the good news is that, that uh, you know, it's, it's three quarters ocean in the, in the world, right? So there's a lot, potentially a lot of algae that we could grow. Um, we, can, we can use, we don't have to use land, good quality land, we, can, we don't even have to use land. You can get very high yields um, in, in because you're, you're not limited by surface area, you're not, you're now you have volume to, to use for, for growing algae. A few years ago, there were 100 startup companies investing in algae um, because everybody thought it was going to be the next, or at least the venture capitalists thought it was going to be the next big energy thing. Um, so that was all good news. Um, but if you, if you go through the economics, you know, optimistically, you probably need $200 a barrel oil before it, it's competitive today. Um, and it's not really proven at scale yet. So we might, we might get better. Um, if you want to reduce your costs, you really want to use a concentrated source of CO2 to feed the algae. And, and uh, that both adds cost, but it also means that you're putting um, CO2 uh, back to the atmosphere. For example, if you use fossil CO2, um, the carbon mitigation benefit is not that great. And I'll show you some numbers on that. And then uh, you need lots of water handling because obviously algae grows in water. And moving around a lot of water uh, costs money and and energy. And this is just a rough calculation. If you if you uh, how much water do you have to remove to make a liter of gasoline equivalent uh, from al from algae? Um, I won't go through the details here. The bottom line is that if you have a liter of of gasoline equivalent with 100% conversion of algae into into gasoline energy. You need about eight. You need to process about 1,800 liters of water. Um, so that's a lot of water moving around that you have to do. And and but you know that's a good engineering challenge for, for, for others to work on. Um, so so water is one issue. And then the, I think this might be my last slide. We just did a very rough calculation of what the greenhouse balance would be if you have um, a coal-fired power plant that. Uh, normally would just send its electricity out to the atmosphere. Uh, sorry, it's uh, CO2 out to the atmosphere. But now we're going to take that CO2 and put it into the algae pond. Um, some of that CO2 is not, is not going to be absorbed by the algae, um, and it'll slip back to the atmosphere. But then we make algae, we convert it to fuel, and make diesel fuel, and then we run our vehicles with that diesel fuel, and the CO2 comes out the tailpipe here. So we, we compared the, the greenhouse emissions for this on a life cycle basis against the possibility of just having a coal-fired power plant by itself and just using diesel fuel for the cars. So there are two systems that are providing the same amount of liquid fuel and the same amount of electricity, but one's doing it in this sort of using the CO2 twice, 
whereas the other one isn't. And the, uh, the result is uh, that we get about a 20% reduction in system-wide life cycle greenhouse emissions. So it, it, we do get a reduction because we've used the CO2 here to make algae, but it's not, you know, it's not huge. Um, it won't solve our carbon problem, but it, it might help until we figure out how to do something other than coal-fired power plants. So I'm not, I'm not so optimistic about algae, in the, in certainly not in the short term. In the long term, there are big companies like ExxonMobil that are making investments in algae because if, they think that if, uh, if biofuel is going to make it in a, in a very large scale, it's going to have to be through something like algae. But I don't think they believe that, the, that it's near term. Um, okay, so that's just a quick recap. Um, I don't need to go through, go through that. That's what we've talked about. And do we have any time for questions? Or a few minutes? Okay. So, questions? Yes. Very interesting, Professor Eric. Uh, very a great overview of the bioenergy um, problem. Uh, in this country here, there is a discussion on um, second generation um, biomass applied to um, sugarcane plane because they have solved the the plants that produce uh, ethanol, they have sort of have a good walking stick as well <laughs> because they produce electricity and that has been a source of revenue for them. And I'm wondering, in the discussion is, should uh, we burn the baguettes uh, or try to transform it in second generation ethanol. The discussion is around this. Um, I really don't see m much reason for uh, reasons for investment for a second generation plant. Um, instead, it seems technological point of view. I, I don't know much about the environment point of view if the um, this, uh, 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 how the, is the competition between the burning directly, producing steam, and powering a Rankine cycle, or you know, having a second generation. The discussion is more or less this. We also have the Vines problem, but this is a different question. That's the idea is going direction for gasification. But but the the, the pre previous one, that's one point people are discussing in this country. Yeah, I, I think the, whether you go for second generation biofuels with, with bagasse or, and, or trash, or you um, uh, use it to make electricity, if you use conventional electricity technology, we could do that today easily. The second generation biofuels is, I would say, not quite commercially viable yet. Um, but in order to get there, there would have to be some some demonstrations and some testing to do it. I think ultimately it's the value of the electricity versus the value of the liquid fuel. So if 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 you're elect if you can if a company can get more per unit of the gas for the electricity after they take away their costs, then that's the one that they're going to go for. And but but and maybe so maybe the predictability of the electricity costs or electricity prices in Brazil versus the unpredictability of oil prices, there's a different risk there as well. So it's, it's yeah, I don't have an easy answer for, <laughs> for how to do it. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I just try to, to give a, a comment. Stand up. Okay. Uh, I'd like just to make a short comment on that. Here we have an additional difficulty, as Eric knows quite well. Uh, our sugarcane sector is very conservative. Very, 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 very conservative. So uh, even when we started to push for cogeneration and the electricity surplus production, it was a big fight. Uh, 
to convince them. So finally, they realized that could be another source of revenue, and they went. That I just saw uh, show that uh, we have now more, more or less half of the mills producing surplus. But you see, uh, even consider that the sector ha has passed for several economic difficulties in recent years. Uh, it shrinked a little bit. We reduced the number of meals. Uh, we still have, we, st we had only two pilot plants for second generation, one in Alagoas, which shut down. The other here in Sao Paulo is Raizen, the big group, but not so much. So I think uh, we have also all these issues related to this conservative behavior. And uh, even consider economic difficulties, I think uh, we also have to take this into account. So yeah, it's I another challenge. Yeah, I, I would say that there's, there's no industry that I've encountered that isn't conservative. <laughs> they, 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 they're in the business of making money. And uh, yeah. On the other hand, um, this is a little bit of a digression, but um, we have a professor in my my center that studies uh, psychology behavior of, of people around energy issues and both people and institutions and she has some she's defined something called status quo bias so you're biased as an industry or you're biased as a person toward what you know until the status quo changes and then that becomes the new status quo then you then you're biased against towards that one right so getting that change, the first change that you talked about to, to recognize that electricity is a good revenue source is an important um, first step. And yeah, anyway, so we had, okay. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I was wondering, actually, I have two questions. Uh, it was only two slides, but I would, I would uh, try to ask you about uh, OJ. Uh, what there is, what if there is one, what will be the walking stick for Aljan? Because you are trying to convert it just for energy. And if there is one, well, I would like to know it. And there is any, um, for instance, I, I'm not uh, researching that area, but I see that uh, for Aljan, uh, there is some possibility to convert it like using a hunting cycle See, we could uh, reduce a lot of transportation of fuel if you install your site next to the some kind of building or some kind of, of, of civil construction that will allow you to reach the, the fuel or sell it like a food or something else. What to think about? Yeah, so um, I think there are, and uh, maybe you know more about what the byproducts might be, but uh, there, there are byproducts, I think, that can come out of algae. Um, I think the, the issue with any walking stick is how big is the walking stick compared to the fuel market. So the fuel market is huge, right? So if, but if you're relying on um, the byproduct to make the economics work, the market for that byproduct has to be as large as the fuel market. Otherwise, you'll saturate and you won't have the walking stick anymore. So that's just something to, and there are very few markets as large as energy markets. And so it's finding the walking stick that will allow a big scale up of bioenergy is challenging. But there will be, I think, niche, you know, uh, smaller markets where algae might fit because of its byproduct. But I'm, I'm not an expert on it, so I won't give you more than that. There's a couple questions over here, I think. Uh, so you showed to us like that study with two kinds of feedstocks, the one you grow in the marginal land and the, the other one. That was for the upstream, right, for the feedstock. So I just wanted to know for the downstream, uh, because I guess like for this kind of marginal land, we need to grow most like grasses. grasses. So I, I don't know about the technologies, like do we have mature technologies for this and do you think that the downstream is, is going to be even like it's 
because the upstream is really good for this kind of feedstock. And I just wanted to know for the downstream if it's not going to be so high because maybe the technology, we need more fuel to power the system because of it's like more, you know, the, the biomass is more difficult to convert. Um, yeah, so th I didn't talk too much about the downstream, but the, the technologies for bio, making biofuels are not, they're not commercial yet. Um, things like gasification or um, the, the fermentation biochemical conversion routes that have been tried in Brazil, um, they're not yet commercially established. But the, we've done, we've modeled a lot of those systems and the efficiency is quite, quite good, M maybe 50% energy efficiency which isn't too bad. Um, so I, I don't think the, um, it's, the feedstocks are challenging, uh, more challenging than using corn grain or sugar juice, but um, that's just, that's what we have to deal with. But the, but the process can be pretty efficient, I think. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my question is about uh, the debate around peak travel. Uh, we've seen that peak travel. Peak travel, okay. Yeah, uh, we don't see anymore the peak oil debate after the reduction of the oil prices. And I've seen some articles talking about the, the peak travel, like the differences in the preferences of the newer generations regarding traveling regarding uh, living closest, closer to the uh, cities and not living in the suburbs and preferring like being connected and sharing vehicles rather than owning their vehicles. And I have two questions regarding that. Uh, the first one is how do you see that debate? How, uh, if you see, some people say this phenomenon just happens in the US. So I wanted to know your opinion about that. If you, if you think it's just locally and uh, what is this impact what is the impact on the biofuel industry in the long run and the second question is uh, if you think this could uh, happen in the rest of the world and the impact in Brazil for example uh, if the newer generations yeah prefer to not own the car well, you're a lot younger than me, so you should probably answer the question about the younger generations. I, it's, you know, there, in the U.S., the travel per, per capita has, has leveled off now. So we're not, so people, the average uh, person drives, I don't know, 12,000 miles or something per year. It's a, a large number, but it, it had always been climbing, but now it's, it's started to level off. And, that maybe that's why some of the discussions that you're talking about have come on. It looks like maybe we've hit, hit the peak pass passenger travel at least. But I think um, I think it's a long way from from starting to come down in any dramatic fashion. I think it much more important will be to increase the efficiency with which we uh, generate those miles traveled. So so in the U.S. We still have the, caf <coughs> the cafe standards, unless somebody gets his way and is able to, to cancel them. But the cafe standards are the corporate average fuel economy standards, which are required by the automakers to make certain efficiency cars. So the average efficiency of a car in the U.S. today is about 25 miles per gallon. That's the, I don't know, I can't do the conversion quickly, but 25 miles per gallon by Within seven years, it should be 55 miles per gallon. So a, a huge increase in the efficiency of vehicles is mandated by the law, and that will have much more impact than, than uh, waiting for people to saturate on their travel, I think. And I think the rest of the world is, you know, the U.S. is probably one of the highest traveling countries. Um, and, and in part because it has such a good infrastructure or that makes e traveling easy, but other countries are still building that infrastructure. I think so. I think travel is going to continue to increase in other countries. Um, but it would be a if people started living more you know, closely in in, in cities, um, that would certainly have an important impact. But I think it's it's a harder change than to change the technology. So.
one more over here. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Regenium from Brazil, from University of Campinas. And according with the data you presented, bioenergy is not enough to be the only renewable energy to be used in the future. So um, if we consider Brazil as an example where the first generation ethanol is enough to compete with oil resource, and we are able to produce in an economic way that's viable to use, uh, what do you think would be another source of renewable energy that it w uh, would be used together with ethanol in this case to, com to complete the need of energy that we have? And uh, do you think it's possible to use the biomass that is produced, like um, the lignocellulose biomass to produce chemicals in this case? Uh, so the, the second question first, the chemicals, y yeah, that's a... That's an easier uh, market to get into because the value is much higher than fuels. So, and, I, and, the, and some of the companies that started out um, aiming to do second generation biofuels, they've in fact changed direction and doing uh, chemicals and pharmaceuticals and things like that. Which, and so they're able to stay in business and maybe in the long term develop the second generation biofuel technology. So I think that is a, a viable route to, to start. Um, as far as, as uh, something to complement ethanol in, in Brazil or elsewhere, um, you know, some, a lot of people are interested in the idea of, of uh, power to fuels. So making, elect making hydrogen electrolytically from water and then combining with CO2 that you capture from the air, for example. Um, but the economics of that are I would say far from uh, cl near near term. Um, an another idea is that if you capture um, CO2 from, say, fermentation, and you store the CO2 below ground, your your bio bioethanol is now negative emission uh, fuel, and that essentially leaves some room in the atmosphere to use petroleum to. Uh, so you could have a mix of pet still, still use some petroleum, but still have net zero greenhouse gas emissions, right? And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that more this afternoon. Okay, and in this case, uh, do you think the first generation ethanol in Brazil is considered sustainable? Because it's a first generation, so... Uh, it seems pretty sustainable to me from what I've, you know, all the metrics that I went through the water issues, the the land competition issues, the economics, especially. Um, so it would be viable continue burning the bagasse to produce electricity and keep the first generation just. Also, I, I think that would be a that I would consider that a sustainable system. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that uh, considering this idea of uh, carbon capture, uh, as I said yesterday, we had a few examples in Brazil. Uh, in Paraná, we have a Copacana, a sugar mill, selling CO2 uh, to produce uh, chemicals, uh, sodium carbonate, and also CO2 to be used in greenhouse to grow uh, wood, logs, and uh, other woods. So. Also, maybe this would be easier than uh, capture and storage. So uh, this is something we have been studying that maybe the use for chemicals and for other uses uh, together with the, the, the biofuels. And I think you are going to discuss this this afternoon a little bit. I will, I will talk about that a little bit. The, the, the problem with the, I mean, I think what you're suggesting is a good initial use for the CO2, greenhouses and chemicals and so on but it's the walking stick problem with scaling up the industry. There are not that many greenhouses compared to cars on the road, right? So, so you'll run out of places to use the CO2 unless you do something else. Yeah. Hi, Professor. If 
If I may, uh, what do you think about what is the role of the the, the municipal solid waste as a bioenergy? Because as far as I know, uh, if I have money, I will not build a facility to burn municipal solid waste to generate electricity. I will have something. I will need a walking stick to, uh, like, no, I have to make a contract also to to collect, and then this contract will be profitable, and I have this, uh, I will have this, 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 this to make uh, something to be more, you know, more, more sustainable. What do you think that will be the whole of municipal solid so waste? I, I think that's an important uh, potential bioenergy source. The, the, um, the, there are some technical challenges with, with using it. Um, because of the, the you know, contaminants that are in it, it can be difficult even f just for simple burning. Um, but if but there are ways to deal with that, and in Europe they do quite a bit of that. But the the walking stick in that case is that, uh, for example, in in New York City, New York City pays maybe a hundred dollars per ton to somebody to take the MSW, right? And so if you're a generator, you get paid to take the feedstock. That's a negative feedstock cost. That's essentially like the walking stick uh, in the economics. So I think if you can get technology that works, and the other problem in the United States is the, the NIMBY problem. Does anybody know the acronym NIMBY? Yeah, not in my backyard, right? And there's another one called BANANA. Anybody know that one? No. Build, build, uh, BANANA build. Don't build anything anywhere near anybody or something like that. It, it's, it, it, but it's the s social opposition to it because uh, concern about, about air pollution, which mm. can be dealt with through technology, but people are afraid of it. So that's another, uh, not something that engineers are probably going to solve. Okay. We, uh, any more questions or should we have lunch? Okay, um, we're done then. Thank you. Okay, so lunch time. Lunch time.